to have Dr. Pupil here today. Um, I was one of those physicians about three years ago that when a cancer patient came to me and said, what can I do, what can I eat for my diet, just, just keep eating whatever you're eating, have some ice cream, you're fine, it's not going to make a difference. I was really um, uh, a very different physician at that time. And then I saw a little movie called Forks Over Knives. And I was really, really, really impacted by that movie. Um, you followed to read the book, um, The China Study, and proceeded to read about it. And now I'm one of those physicians that my nurse, Shanna, will tell the patients, don't ask her about diet. <laughs> because we'll never get out of here today because she, she'll continue to talk about diet for hours on end. And uh, Dr. Campbell has been a huge, huge influence in that change. And so I'm very, very, very excited and honored that um, he's agreed um, to come talk to us today. I think one of the things that he does differently than a lot of people do differently, than a lot of people in um, this field is he's a scientist. And he's going to present scientific evidence um, as to the effect of diet and nutrition on health. Thank you very much.
consumption of protein, especially so-called high-quality protein. And I make that point because what I'm going to end up with is rather different from what that was all about. Um, this caught my attention after having been working in the Philippines for a bit, organizing a nationwide program of feeding healthy children. Uh, and, and seeing, I thought, uh, that certain children seem to have a predisposition for getting primary liver cancer. Not an unusual thing, but there it was. Uh, and the paper here came out about that time, too, uh, from India, showing that when rats were fed, a carcinogen that gives liver cancer was histopathological sort of images that was about the same as humans. In any case, when rats were fed two different levels of protein after having been exposed to a chemical carcinogen, okay, this is the results they got. They quite frankly didn't believe those results that went on to pursue their careers in a very different track. I thought this was quite serious because I thought I'd be seeing this in children especially. So basically, in these animals, two different groups, both do a course in, to give liver cancer, okay, and then fed either two different levels, fed two different levels of protein. Either 20% of total calories, which is the usually recommended levels, okay, or 5% of the level. And so what they got, as you can see here, uh, is that the animals given the higher levels of protein, 100% got cancer. The animals got the 5% and none of and that's in fact what I, quite frankly, thought I was seeing as well in, in the children. So that was actually the observation that then got me into, again, an NIH grant that was the last for the next 27 years, where we really tried to get in to understand, is this true? Now, they were very provocative. This, this was exactly the opposite of what I would have thought. Um, and we wanted to pursue the idea, see where this one takes, and how it was working, if you will. So I'm going to share with you uh, and, and there's sort of the bottom line. That, that's kind of shocking. Increase in protein, increase in cancer, that's weird okay, to say the least, especially by coming from my sort of very, very background, if you will. Um, and as I said, this is 46 years ago, this is what I So I'm going to show you basically, first of all, it's true. It's really true. And I want to also discuss with you a little bit of the kind of evidence that really got me to believing it. Um, and so this first slide, if you will, uh, simply shows uh, the formation of early liver cancer in rats exposed to the same carcinogen. The carcinogen, incidentally, was the most potent carcinogen at that time ever killed, called um, aflatoxin. They said, you know, that compound. But in any case, these animals are exposed to uh, aflatoxin carcinogen, then fed two different of protein. Okay, we got protein here, chemical mutation, if you will, uh, on the left hand side. And so animals that had 20% protein in the first 12 weeks, they grew those cancer by the nice life with a 20% protein. In contrast, the animals that had 5% protein did not. Even though they had been exposed to the, to the carcinogen. And so here, what we're demonstrating is actually what we've done in India. What I thought I was seeing in, in the Philippines, so we're getting excited and it's going down the track. It's, with the lock of interest in. We did many kinds of experiments on this sort of note, if you will, and looked at it in different ways. And this is one way. I thought, well, why don't we just sort of uh, switch guys back and forth as these cancers are growing? So here's animals fed 20% going up that dotted line, if you will, forming their cancers. The animals fed 5%, we can turn it off. Fed 20%, turn it back on and off. That was a really exciting uh, proposition, and together with some other ways of looking at this question, we learned, in fact, that in spite of the fact that we gave a potent carcinogen, the question of whether or not that carcinogen led to carcinogenesis was a function of the level of protein intake. And we can turn it on and turn it off, so it was reversible. It's a really exciting uh, concept, if you will, uh, that got us uh, going down this road. Turned out the protein we were using protein in cow smell. That's why I told you I think the dairy That was a little bit larger than that no pun intended. Uh, you know, to get to that particular point there, and it took me a couple of years to try to pound it in my head. You know, we're really on to something, is what to say. Um, okay, so I'm saying maybe protein controls the cancer will. We, I actually did it in a slightly different way. I took another model of that actually to 
instead of a rat near a garbage to chemical parsing, we would use some mice, transgenic mice, that were programmed to get liver cancer, if you will. They were transfected with an HPV or the virus gene. And this is just three, four plots of the histo slides, if you will. Uh, up in the left, upper right hand corner, or left hand corner, this is a non transgenic normal animal slide. Here's one instead of um, 6%, and that's probably about 5%, of course. Here's what it looks like for 6%. These are not the best slides, I'm sure you can appreciate. This is pretty old stuff. Uh, so here's a normal one, more or less. No growth here, essentially. The dark colored material is less than is the antigenic material that tends to rise as the, as the uh, lesion starts to form. So over here, a 12% protein. You see some stuff here. Over here, quite a lot. So we are seeing, even in this model here, starting with a hepatitis or uh, with a viral gene instead of a chemical carcinogen, you can see the same thing. The protein was essentially uh, basically controlling and causing that gene to be expressed in the world. Um, now, here, let me just work on this idea here. I want to really focus for this, at this time. As I said, we get kind of interested. I wonder how this works. I wonder what the mechanism is. What hard evidence? One thing to sort of prove and see the observation at the end of the day, but one can look at. So, what I'm showing here, incidentally, this timeline, you may have seen this yourself if you've been involved in Parker Dennis type things. That's a timeline showing, sort of, in, in, in a sense, the arbitrary three stages of cancer development. Starting out with initiation over here. And then pr promotion, okay, and then progression. That, that's the kind of model we tend to put in our heads, those of us in the search, working in those three phases, because you know, they each have somewhat different characteristics. And so, with that in mind, we started looking for what's the mechanism here? How does this protein turn this cancer off? So, we started looking at things up here listed in, in the first day. So, and here's what we were learning. One of the first things we did was to see that the high protein diet increases the entry of the carcinogen into the cell. I don't know how it was doing it, but it was simply increasing the amount of the carcinogen that actually got transported into the cell. Then secondly, it was also increasing an enzyme called the mixed function oxidase, also called, by the way, drug metabolizing enzyme. So those of you who may know, it's a, it's a fascinating enzyme. It's very complex. It, metabolizing all kinds of substrates and so forth and so on. It's an enzyme that is known to activate chemical carcinogens to get a reactive metabolite that binds to DNA covalent, and that's the sort of initial mutagenic event that gets them started. In any case, the high protein that increases the synthesis of that enzyme very quickly, right upon feeding the high protein that the enzyme has to be start to come up more carcinogen cell, more activation, if you will. And also, this is a big area here. It altered the enzyme structure. And I don't have time to get into what the implications of all that is. But basically, high protein dies, more enzyme, twisting and turning that enzyme around in some fascinating ways, and actually causing it to metabolize the carcinogen, if you will, to activate it instead of uh, de detoxifying and getting rid of it. So anyhow, we, we solved that. So we got a couple of mechanisms here. This is one, here's another one. There's a, actually three or four embedded in that one. Uh, and then, so it increases the binding of the carcinogen to the DNA estimization. And we had some ideas now. We did that to one of my colleagues. Uh, this uh, laboratory uh, found out the site in the DNA of the bat. We're kind of specific here. We're really learning about that, a lot about the theory getting the bat. Then, we said, okay, what, what's, what's the mechanism here about? Well, now the, the, the implication or the, the, the idea of like everybody else did more or less. You know, we were looking for the great limit of the enzyme, which was pretty key. So we looked down here at this second stage, the, the promotion where uh, you get chronal expansion, first cells there, they have to reduce cell division, and the eyes and bodies and bodies, and so you eventually get some cell mass. In any case, it turns out various things here, the high protein diet lowers natural killer cell activity, which is one way that you know our bodies deal with this kind of thing. You get the, the, the neoplasmic cell, cell, if you will, uh, the 
natural killer cell uh, comes into play and wipes it out. You know, lines work pretty well that way. Uh, but this particular case, the fact that these are actually lower than active. Here you got this nutrient in a sense, so it's sort of saying, hey, we're not going to fix things up so fast. We'll create more, let's not sure you know, about. Uh, and also, the high protein diet increases cell replication. That's another sort of domain of, of the mechanism of the world. Very interesting. And that, in turn, in later years, we did this early on, this was in the 1970s, actually. Later on, we turned to the, our attention to a, uh, a, a new interest at that time in, in the growth factor that, that turns on enzymes. And so, this is insulin like growth factor 2. Now we know insulin like growth factors are a couple of three or four isomers, if you will. That this protein was increasing the growth factor to sort of stimulate the growth of the cancer cell. This was another thing here that's fascinating. The high protein diet increases oxygen radicals. The free radicals are very highly reactive oxygen radicals. They tend to be associated with tumor promotion. They tend to be associated with, uh, with uh, aging. They tend to be associated with the formation of acetylosplotic releasing as well. Free radicals is not exactly the thing to mess with. So we, the body has a way of dealing with those and have lots of antioxidants and take care of But in any case, there is another mechanism. But also, this is another one that's very interesting here, too. The high protein diet altered the utilization of calories. And calories plays a role in this. This we always thought, and most of us believe that, too. But it actually had it affected calorie, uh, not calorie intake so much, but calorie distribution. Uh, calories in the body. And again, I don't have a chance to get into the details. These are these, of course, a couple of seminars. Here, here's the bottom line. We spent, and I burned up probably, I don't know, at least 10 to 12 PhD theses, each working for a whole uh, dissertation, four or five years on these mechanisms. That was their work. Looking for another mechanism, looking for another mechanism. Finally got to a point where after some years of doing this kind of stuff, maybe you know, it's all for years or so, I, I, I wonder, we can't find this mechanism. I don't know which one is, these are right limited. Which one's going to be limited? But I didn't know to me, there is no such thing, for the most part. Not in nutrition, I can tell you. There's no such thing. When a nutrient comes in and does its business, it just seems like a whole tsunami of mechanisms sort of operate. Kind of working together and converging in activity to you know, produce the result. Come back to that a little bit later on. It's a really fascinating uh, idea, I think. So, um, oh, I'm so sorry. This is that's not over here. But that's okay. I, I'm just trying to help illustrate what's going on here. I already told you this. I'm getting ahead of myself. I had this presented in such a way that you know, we should focus on these different things. And I think I told you, is that good enough? By that, get into more details. There's um, um, jump to this. Here's the end I'm talking about. But you know, when a carcinogen gets into our tissues, it gets into our tissues. Most carcinogens get activated by this mixed function oxidase enzyme. That mixed function oxidase has does a business of, of basically detoxifying foreign compounds. That's one of the big things it does. But it also has this capability of activating some carcinogen to get this highly reactive metabolite, which in this particular case is an amplifying concept. It's reactive and then it just is so reactive it doesn't need an enzyme to sort of attack phase, so it ends up attacking this nuclear code of DNA. And that's where all this business comes from. That, that, uh, the enzyme is all I can say is faster, the way that sort of works and how uh, nutrient interface affects us. Boy, I did mess myself up here, but anyhow, I think you guys messed it up. In a way, it's kind of good because I don't spend so much time talking about it now. Um, okay, it increases cell replication, oxygen radicals, cell use, okay, there we go. Um, so, this was all done with the, this high quality protein, casein. Casein represents about 87% of cow's milk. It's sort of at the top of the list of all the proteins that are known, it's at the top of the list of being the most. The most effective by its quality. But we turn your attention down to uh, what's interesting. Okay, casein does this. How about a couple plant proteins? So we put in soy protein and wheat protein, that needs to be animals too. They did not increase the pretense of growth. Even when they were fed at the point of, 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 of 
full of calories. And all of a sudden, I mean, this is just one, what's this, what, three, three samples? But one is uh, casein, and animal based, I only got two plant based ones. But you see this huge difference in what this. And I can assure you, even though we haven't done all the other proteins, it's, it's very expensive to go on time. On time that what we're looking at here was a real dichotomy between plant proteins on one hand, animal proteins on the other. We can talk about that later. later. But if, if I took this to mean this casein effect of being uh, and uh, <coughs> animal proteins in general, right there, as opposed to plant proteins. Quite a striking thing here. Now, going to that point, going to that point, here is a publication of a friend of mine, Dr. Ken, Ken Carroll, uh, from Bluffton, Ontario, who also had a, some ideas about uh, heart disease. And her goal in protein to find heart disease possible for reaching serum cholesterol level, of course, after in those days. And so what he did, he compared all the animal proteins. And what you can see here is that here's all the animal proteins up here, increasing cholesterol levels. This is, this is rabbit studies. Try all the different proteins to see what effect that is serum cholesterol. And all the animal proteins are pushing cholesterol up. Here's all the plant proteins down here. So we see that you know, really kind of segregation of these two groups of proteins. And, and this tends to hold true, by the way, for other kinds of outcomes too, not just serum cholesterol, not just cancer, but all those sorts of things. Uh, so we, as I said, we see this aggregation. Animal proteins tend to do one kind of thing, plant proteins tend to do another kind of thing. And plus, we can see some differences between proteins within an each group as well. But the main point here is that there's this segregation of, of uh, activities of, of proteins. Now, I'm just going to kind of throw in some other things here because now what I want to get to for your consideration is what is protein doing? I meant this happens in this kind of way. You know, I'm stimulating cancer development. What else is, what else do we know about this? And I have to tell you there's a lot of research now in the market, most of which has been set aside over here. People don't want to hear about protein causing any, any kind of problem. And we love protein. We want more. That's a, that's a story. So, we don't quite go there. But in any case, here's the relationship between non fat milk, that's protein. That's, that's, that's skimming off the fat, leaving behind the protein. And here's the relationship between non fat milk, protein, if you will, and prostate cancer. Isn't that kind of interesting? Higher protein, and now it comes to milk, and now we know in fact not it comes to calories, or just to go really take a jump a leap phase forward, uh, people with prostate cancer, for example, GSA levels may be very negative. If you take them off the dairy, GSAs don't come down. Very interesting. So that's a, that's a little hint of something interesting there. Protein affecting prostate cancer. Oh, uh, by the way, now the protein also increases in this case, it isn't like those factors. Why? Well, I don't know the contents, but I'm sure it may be more than that quite well. Uh, here's no consumption in breast cancer. It's pretty interesting. And uh, I wish I had the time to get into the intricacies of this, because eventually we got involved in this massive big survey of cancer in China. We're going to have great detail. We put together a model and I'm going to argue that in fact breast cancer fits within the framework. The etiology of breast cancer is in the framework of how much dairy is being consumed in addition to other kinds of foods that have similar nutrition problems. But in any case, there's what it looks like. Uh, that's a pretty nice, classic straight line in the country. Same with uterine cancer. Different points, incidentally, but you know, I just want to put this illustrate the same sort of thing. High protein diets tend to increase the occurrence of the I'm just saying there's protein in this case, and I'm cautious about that. Saying that's the association that we, we tend to see. Not necessarily the protein is doing all the bad work. It's just that we see that, that kind of relationship. Uh, but it fits within the, the concerns involving the effect of the protein, if you will, on the formation of cancer. Okay, enough of that. I could show you, and I wish I had time, to show you other kinds of evidence, too. To show the relationship consumption of animal-based protein, I'm going to say, turning out in some cases being 
whole bunch of other animal voice function in which we get these kind of phenomena, these kind of results. Now, it's really, and it's been ignored. People don't want to pay attention to it. Uh, now, I want to turn your attention to the whole question of certain particles. And I know uh, your folks are, uh, I get a kind of interest in oncology in here, but that's not that, that part of the disease question a little bit, because something interesting has happened here, historically. And I'm going to show this, this illustration because uh, I'm, I'm going to ask the question, at least I've been asked the question myself, how come we have come to believe what we believe for so long? So we have to go back in history a little bit to see where things sort of came from. In this particular case, you know there's a brilliant history on the role of protein and the formation of, boy, and the elevation of serum cholesterol and the formation of atherogenic events. We got it going over here. We always think, you know, saturated fat, total fat. That's what causes cholesterol to go up. And, and it's a very, very simplistic view. But that's what we think, and that in turn leads to vascular lesion. In any case, here's a, a quote from a friend of mine, the late uh, Dave Chesky, uh, talking about his book at some of the early literature on this. It goes back 100 years ago, or the 1900s actually. <coughs> he published this in 1983. He said, The contribution of protein and development of progression of vascular sclerosis is gaining new recognition. <coughs> and this is 1983. New recognition that comes back. The new work is building on the observation made over 70 years ago. Now 40 years ago, your players put this out. We still, we still got ahead in the thought. Well, all we're talking about for the most part is how basically fat, saturated fat in particular, you know, elevate total cholesterol, healthy other cholesterol, and that's all kind of bad, other bad things, if you will, that leads to the moment of pathogenesis. I think that uh, acknowledgement by Dr. Chesky in 1983. Many of you are interested in going back to look at some of the literature. This is some references here, if you will, if you will, back to 1926, 1923, <laughs> Actually, there's some other earlier ones in the Russian literature where some of the stars in 1905 to 10. I don't think I can read Russian, so I have to leave that off. Um, so in any case, what the early research showed, and that looks like it's really, you know, kind of, we're not really good experiments, quite nice for those days. We didn't know the techniques we had these days. But animal protein, casein, actually elevates serum cholesterol much better than saturated fat. Protein is far more important in the etymology of the atherogenic lesion, dust, and heart disease than its total fat or saturated fat. So, again, I want to bring this to your attention because it is a kind of consistent with what we're seeing here. Protein is like the really interesting. So here's one in publication in Brad that's actually a good model for the development of natural process in 19, uh, what was it, 1941. Uh, animals fed uh, either casein or soy, and then measuring sclerotic activity, you know, the size of the leaf and so forth. Uh, look at this, a five increase in sclerotic activity when you did casein compared to soy. Why does all that ignore? Actually, from the 1940s until the 50s and 60s and 70s, it turns out all the people have been doing this and got into doing human work too. But it all just kept being ignored. Finally, the people are talking about in the 70s or 80s, why is it called, you know, soy is such a much cholesterol anemic. Soy is a good thing. You might get a cholesterol level. That was in large measure almost justification for the expanding of the soy industry, sort of like industry, because it, you know, lower cholesterol level, so to say. You go back and look this the other way down. Maybe the level of cholesterol, and that's what genesis that you see in soy, in the soy situation, maybe that's the norm. You can turn around and say, why is casein so high for cholesterol women? It's just sort of the opposite. You know, you know tend to think that, that, that soy, that, that high protein is a good thing, and soy is just kind of interesting with it. I think it was that set. Now I'm going to show you just another, just to get my, and what I'm going to work in the here is raising some questions about protein that doesn't become central to understanding the full story about uh, diet and relates to cancer in this particular case of small diseases. Here's one of breast cancer. I show this because it's been seen by so many people and over the years, you sort of know it in a sense. Uh, namely, here's a publication in 1975, I think by Ken Carroll, was 
strong a relationship between breast cancer and different countries as well as I've been taking. You've seen this, this had a lot to do with, especially when it's compared or combined with information showing high fat, low heart disease, Framingham study, uh, you know, those kinds of studies that were done starting in the 60s and 70s and 80s. Here's one on the diet for fat, breast cancer, higher fat, higher breast cancer. That really took a grip on public imagination. Because now we're now we're really concerned about fat. We got to get low fat diets. And at that time, that combination of the heart disease uh, studies, especially cancer disease and others, uh, together with this emerging information on cancer, it really said to the public, "We got to have low fat diets. Meat, you know, skin milk is better than whole milk. Meat cuts of meat is better than whole." Milk. That kind of thinking was driving this debate. It turns out this information here was quite frankly very superficial. And I checked it and it wasn't I used Dr. Carroll's uh, some stuff here I'm going to show you on I don't have the chance to show it. But I used some of his data, we have turned his data and I had an opportunity to discuss this with him uh, actually just shortly before he passed away. I'm sorry kind of cut his blessing with his interpretation. But that total fat intake thing, um, it turns out when you look at it, it's like what's kind of fat? We had these data that nobody ever paid attention to. There's no relationship with plant fat intake and breast cancer. Hey, don't know that, okay. You do the animal fat and segregate that up, there you see it. As soon as some animal fat is put in there, breast cancer starts to what? If you want to look at it theoretically, that's what we suggest. It's, it's a, an observation of all this my study, but there's what you see. Put the data in there. Uh, it turns out that, I don't know why I got this, no, I got that in It turns out that animal fat uh, and total, the uh, animal fat and animal protein, the animal fat was not really the cause of this breast cancer. Animal fat had a very high correlation with animal protein. So this is really an animal protein slot. The higher the consumption of animal protein, the higher the breast cancer risk, which is pretty consistent with what the fat uh, we would say in the case of. There's more to this story than I'm telling you, but it's just not making it keep your interest. You've heard of the Nurse and South study. How many have heard of the Nurse and South study? I think all of those people have. The Nurse and South study has been a big study done for years by my friend, uh, Walt Lynn Carver, who uh, had a big cohort of uh, 890,000 nurses, uh, checking out to see, especially, whether there was any relationship between dietary factors and something breast cancer in the environment. Probably over seven years. Um, and uh, in, in the first report, he started, Walt started this in 1984, 1988, it was the first four year report. It startled people, it startled me for one, and others. Uh, but in 1992, we had a major report, this is the eight year study here. What they were attempting to show or determine was whether or not it's really true that fat, if you take fat out of the diet, does that really reduce breast cancer risk? That was a thought. I mean, it was a very popular idea. Got up the press and things like that. And so in 19, what, 1992, he went on in 1914 uh, years, after 14 years of observation, and told the plot, well, this will do for the purpose here. After eight years of following these women, you know, taking different roles of that, they were advised, hey, you know, maybe you should cut down on both that, on both that diet. A lot of women did, they listened. And so we had, at after eight years, had a distribution of women who were consuming still pretty high fat diets. Some were much lower levels of fat. So we divided it into deciles, and here's the plot. Here's the comparison of, of uh, the breast cancer rates, if you will, the odds ratio, versus this line here, the control. Uh, you can see here, they're all the same. As you go decrease fat intake down to something less than 29% fat, no change. No relationship between fat intake and breast cancer. That made the front page of the New York Times, headlines of the New York Times. Another study came out about that time, the Women's House Initiative, that also reported the same thing. That's not related to breast cancer. I have to tell you, that observation that appeared at that time almost destroyed the field that I was involved in. Because so we, we were just learning. I was on the National Academy Committee uh, in 1982 when we came out with the 
report and got a lot of news about diet and nutrition cancer. And so we were getting excited about the diet and nutrition cancer story. This came out, so they used to do the 92. Uh, this came out and uh, hit the headlines. That's not good in breast cancer when we have said, you know, decrease out of it. Let's skip over some stuff here. You almost, as I say, would attenuate the enthusiasm for the whole, whole world of diet and cancer. Because we're all, even though appropriately, focusing on the wrong thing, on fat. That was the problem. It turns out, actually, that the animal, that the animal, I'm sorry about that, because we all are. But um, in any case, uh, as women tend to decrease their fat intake, they actually were known to have to, that they actually increase their concentration of protein. Animal protein also, because 80% of the total protein uh, intake of these women, 80% was from animal sources. Primary animal protein thing. So here you've got fat going down, even if it worked, let's say, let's say when you've got a workload of that, if you're going to increase an already high level of protein here, even higher there, see, you don't see any fat. And that's really where the bottom line is, is, is something more like that. Now I want to take this information and, and say, okay, <coughs> nutrition, I have to jump ahead a little bit here. Uh, we tend to think, you know, we tend to think about nutrition on a nutrient by nutrient basis, one nutrient time. Even this discussion I just had here, both are focused on protein, or focused on fat, they can do with some vitamins and so forth and so on. It's a massive area of for, for confusion, I'm sure you all appreciate when you do it that way. Turns out that uh, this I have a new view of nutrition is very holistic, sort of everything works together kind of thing, it's very complex biology, it's a very simple answer in any case. Within that kind of thinking, we've got a couple of signposts here. Number one, individual nutrients don't work. Nutrient supplements, now we know they don't work. They do not prevent cancer, they do not prevent heart disease, they do not do a lot of the things that the industry wanted to, to, for us to think about. In fact, some just nice and normal good nutrients actually increase cancer risk instead of decreasing it. So nutrient supplements is a diversion that I don't even consider to be nutrition. It's pharmacology. The nutrient supplement industry and their, their sort of concept is nutrient supplementation. A lot of it get caught up in thinking, oh, that's nutrition. I'm not putting my truth. Nutrition, that's not where it's at. It's not where it's at. Okay, it's, it's a problem. So, uh, having said that, two signposts. That's, that's one signpost. Individual nutrients is not where it's at. The other signpost that, that we should think as we think about nutrition too is the role of animal protein. But I, now I'm just showing you this a little small glimpse. To get animal protein, high quality protein itself, cause this When we start consuming more and more, and then, you know, to say something else too, we have all the protein we need in consuming, let's say, just plants. In fact, that level of protein is ideal. As soon as we start putting in animal foods, animal protein, therefore, some things happen. And so it becomes a very interesting and complex sort of relationship, taking into consideration that nutrients go together, and taking into consideration that you know, we've got some limits on how we think about protein and stuff. So here's going back to the rat studies we did. Here's a relationship between protein intake, or that protein, and the formation of that cancer. Look right here, see it comes up there? Feeding these are all animals fed, they're partially again. We feed 4%, 6%, 8%, 10%, remember before you start about 5%. But if you go up here like this, that protein is doing its stuff, it's doing good things. Protein is an essential nutrient. You need a certain amount of protein, we're all agree about it. That's what we're demonstrating there. But when you see this level here, it's up here. <coughs> and it turns out this is the area that human consumption really is. 95% of this territory where we might imagine some of the if you will. That's cool, that's what we're doing. Protein is essential, but the bottom line, depending on the dose, got that separation here. So I took that sort of uh, hockey stick kind of graph, we call it, and, and, and sort of extrapolated to a more broad, a, a broader consideration of total health. Total health. Not just cancer, not just heart disease, but other things too. Just to illustrate a point. Okay, here's, here's my graph. And where's the health effects on here on this one? Here's levels of protein. 
What do we know about that? This, we see this kind of monkey stick effect throughout the house. When you go back and actually look at the literature, just then to account for the confusion that we've had with the literature. People just talk about high protein, low protein, or this or that, get all kinds of results, and not really looking at the problem. The minimum protein that we need has been known since the 1930s and 40s. First, the first studies were done on that, as I say at that time, it's around 5 or 6%, and that's enough protein. That's based on what we call natural imbalance studies. It's the amount of protein you need to be consumed in order to match the amount of protein in the form of nitrogen, the amount of nitrogen being off. Okay. It's very simple, plus minus. Uh, so it's around 5 6%. That was on the 1930s, early 40s. That in turn led to the recommended doctor allowance published by the National Academy of Science in those days, 1943. What they did, if you do an experiment, you know, they got a sample group of people, sample subjects, you got a group of people, you might, oh, you know, five, six protein set protein is not what they need. Now you want to extrapolate this to a larger population. So what they did in those days, still do these days, we had a couple of standard deviations adjusted on it. Just to make sure everybody gets enough protein. That's really what it So that's really what the, the this is minimum protein intake. Here's a recommended dietary allowance. It has stood the test of time since 1943 in case of human nutrition. <coughs> it's reviewed every five years by the National Academy of Science, by the expert panel. So it's stood the test of time. We, we always really have to agree on that in all these years. So this is around 8 9 percent protein. What that says is, that's, statistically speaking, you have two standard deviations that make sure, theoretically, that 98% of us are getting our, our protein needs covered. Okay? So, uh, this is the idea. Unfortunately, over the years, because of this enthusiasm for protein that everybody's had, including me, including this, uh, it, it's, we, we tend to assume, assume this is the requirement. You'll read this in the of the country. You'll read it in the professional literature. Even the professional, professional nutrition gets this mess up. They talk about this as the minimum protein and it's not. The minimum is here. This right here is just the recommended <coughs> level for 98% of the people already have enough protein by the time they get to that level. So we don't need more than 8 9%, for a whole host of different sort of outcomes or functions. So let's listen to this. Let's put this face. Here's the average protein in Protein is 70 percent, so it's the first thing you can do that. I showed this before, I showed that before. So we're consuming a diet, to be honest about it, is pretty carnivorous. We're consuming a diet really high in that wonderful, high quality protein. Because historically, we're back to the beginning, 175 years ago, when protein was first discovered. We always assume that the more protein, the better. I've had many people ask me, they would come bigger to explode. Protein, the first thing they face is, where do I get my protein from? Because everybody's assuming that the protein only comes from animal food. That's not true. You know, all the protein we need is an actual place to plant it. So, anyhow, there's where we are. In both of us. Um, that right there is a lot of plant This is probably a lot of plant And it turns out that as we, I don't know where the I had to take a slide out of this. Now I'll go back real quick here. So go back. It turns out, you know, let, let's say we all think, I've got to get my protein. There's only one thing I've got. I've got to get my protein. So we go from the idea of start coming up here. Let's sort of put a little protein in our diet. I put it. And also, we have to assume that uh, total calorie take the world is a zero sum game. We want to, you know, consume about the same level of calories, give or take, you know, our conditions and so forth. We put a little animal protein in there. What happens, the protein, the normal protein goes up, yes. But what really happens, as we add animal protein, we're decreasing high protein. And we do it to the extent that we actually do it. By the time we consume protein at the level of 17, 18 percent total protein, we're loaded up there with that. What does that mean? We've got the hazards concerning the animal protein itself, more free radicals, more uh, growth hormone, more this, more that. 
At the same time we're doing that, we're pushing down things like the plant resources. And this is, the, this is a concept that has been ignored in research. We tell you, what is protein do? It makes pleasure. It turns out whatever it does, it's underestimated. It's underestimated because there's another factor here working too. It's all the good stuff in plant based foods. So as we talk about these two groups of foods, in place of one, we're getting hit twice when we do that kind of thing. And lots and lots of mechanisms involved. So let's look a little bit about the different plants and animals. You just should think it. You know, it's a neutral composition of these foods that actually largely just indicates their function and it actually participates in what they actually do. So here's what animal and plant foods look like. Plants, animals, okay, we've got I sort of divided these, all of these nutrients up in these categories. Antioxidants are complex provided by the, these are first of all made just by plants. I mean, antioxidants really only in plants. Powerful group of materials. We must consume. We've got to keep under control of all that oxygen free radicals that you know are called conditions we know so much about. We've got to consume lots of this here. Keep that under control. Keep the fire down. Complex carbohydrates. Great material, I'm not talking about the sugar, that's not good. I'm talking about the whole natural complex carbohydrates, only made in plants. It's great for gut uh, development, especially keeping our organisms under control. And, uh, now, that ought to be a subject of discussion about the public health. But in any case, uh, vitamins, according to the theoretical definition of vitamins, that's the chemical we need because we can't make them. Vitamins only made like plants. Only, you might say, oh, wait a minute, vitamin D, vitamin A, they're not vitamins. Vitamin D is a hormone. We can make that in the sunshine. Vitamin A is the, uh, basically, theoretically, the vitamin A we talk about, retinol, retinoids. That's only a metabolite for real vitamin, the real vitamin is made here. That only comes from plant plants. So in reality, vitamins are from plants, meats are from plants, and so when we increase protein, we're being hit from all this stuff here. This is what the business is. This is what's really going on. It's a very broad sweeping statement. I don't want to make it, but just take out the literature. It's a very major effect. Fat protein, of course, is present for both animals and plants. You can see it's about that. Look at this. This is just the level that one based on other considerations. The other said there's the ideal level of fat protein right there. Instead, we're up here. But I hope the point of really make is that when you think about nutrition, you've got to think about it. You can use the numbers, you can use this and that, and talk about the nutrition. What we've got to think about it is totality. And that's really where the theory of effects occur. Processed foods are a nuisance, not the thing we want. We really need with dairy. We take that, even take that good stuff out of the plate. Some stuff out of plant. We take out some sugar, we might call it hydrogen, we take out some some white flour, got some, and maybe use some oil from the plant, or some that's supposed to be good, right? We put it all together and we get a donut. <laughs> that's not what I'm talking about. So you know, that, that's the process we use to get the tomato store and on a highway. And stuff like this. That's not where it's at, and that's, that's not all we need by a study to show you. Talk about that. So processed foods are, are really not, not mm -hmm. the game here. So I'm going to summarize here as a quick one. The main points of the Namely, both for cancer and heart disease. Ignore the evidence of the adverse effects of high protein diets, and I'm emphasizing diets and not individuals, inadvertently or otherwise has seriously destroyed priorities for health research, medical practice, public policy, and nutrition education. The public is naturally confused. The professionals are confused. I'm talking about what's actually in my area as well. They've all been confused. It's all part of the game plan. We're so messed up, and we end up, you know, trying to do things with piecemeal, discovering magic bullets, and, and that kind of thing. And using one reason or another, doesn't work. It doesn't work. There's so much research that's done that we already know it doesn't work. The price paid. We believe until now, don't sort of believe this. We believe that cancer is caused by chemical carcinogen. It's not. Chemical carcinogen can lead to uh, mutations. True enough. Fair enough. But in reality, if you're trying to just go look at the words for the purpose just a second, the parts say that we get exposed to, we get exposed to all the time, we get exposed to some radiation, we get exposed to this and that. 
we're seeing the temptations off and on. At some constant level, you're sitting there, we get over that stuff. But that's not the cause of the cancer. It's the beginning of cancer, you already know, that. But whether or not, you know, all the mutation data is something important, it's kind of insignificant. Yeah. What really matters, we get those sort of seeds, those neoplastic seeds planted, whether they go into the big tumors, it's a function of what we eat, it's a function of nutrition. Nutrition is that important. So there's been a mistake, actually, to think about uh, being caused by this one. That's a big deal there. We think of it as we have viruses. We have viruses do make a We have peptide virus, water virus, or nasal damage cancer. We've got peptide B virus or liver cancer. Papilloma virus or COVID virus. We have some viruses there. They don't hang around. They're doing some, making some mutagenic activity. That's for sure. And I think they're also involved in some of the promotions later. But in reality, reality, whether they in fact actually express to do their vertical is really again it's a function of nutrition. Same sort of the same kind of nutrition we do. Radiation, we think this best treated this is a big deal. I really enjoy your conversation that I had last night uh, with some folks here very excited about this. That on, on the basis of theory, and it makes sense. And we got into the business of developing cell patients, chemotherapy. Yes, we did. We were all know better than I do. And the data really is suggesting that's not a very good approach. To be honest with you, it's not a good approach for a number of people. And except for cure for cancer, or you've got something else, yes, I understand that. But in reality, in reality, that's not what the quality is doing. It's really, it has to do with no side effect of aging. You've got one thing, a very potent thing, doing to get targeted to something that sounds reasonable. Form, form something part of your specific kind of cancer cell control. And hopefully we're going to get some results. We're bound to get side effects. We don't have a chance to, to advance that idea too much. But that's the only thing we can really expect to get. Side effects, side effects, side effects. In those days, we get very serious on this. There was, there was little or no return in terms of events. Anyhow, we think radiation surgery, all that kind of stuff. Uh, we've been on the wrong track. Real. The way we're looking at this, I would suggest. We believe that heart disease is mostly caused by high fat diets, especially saturated fats and cholesterol. I argue, you know, it's probably enough, but that's not what it is. And it's best treated by broken surgery. No, it's not. We can now cure heart disease by talking about Dr. Messel, all the Messel, and the clinic, Dr. Orange. We're both sort of work, kind of work together in many ways. You may know that that more clearly. Even in advanced heart disease, almost like 100% of the cases, you put them on this low protein, low fat diet, whole food, plant based diet, that the heart disease starts to dissipate in a hurry. Very quickly. There's no drug, nothing, that comes here and compare to what that can do. So we have trillions of dollars in our spent. We go back and look at what the history of science is in this field. We focused on, let's get back down, get more. Just add up the number of deaths that occurred in the facility recommendation that mistake that we made. You know, on all the diabetes, trillions of dollars have been spent for a long time. Science has destroyed the lives of us and the environment is great. That sounds great. Like hell, that's a good thing. <laughs> but in reality, in reality, these are these things are true. These are true. And the whole question concerning the environment, global warming. The World Bank's been involved in that one. Uh, financial models. The Cameron was very interested in it. quite interested in this too. You know, you have agent, agent, agencies. If, if you accept global warming being a sort of anthropogenic number of things made, it turns out that the majority of the global warming is contributed by the livestock. I mean, it's a surprise to you, but that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to leave it at that. I'm standing up for the market of things I think for a day. Okay, this is the China study we published in 2005. It's been very exciting. Uh, it's gotten uh, much, much better than even I thought it would be. I was pretty popular when I wrote with my son, who is a physician himself, and that was working together on that. Uh, that's where it turned out to be quite a surprising and exciting extent because all the reports were made back. So I wish I, you don't need to believe this. I said, well, you don't need to believe it. Just try it. We've been trying. 
in and try and get a spectacular result. And I would suggest that any of you in here who want to disbelieve this, the question is, just try it. Old food, my face bags, without any back, back salt sugar. It's truly amazing. Uh, there's a cookbook our daughter did. This is no one here around trying to elaborate on the sort of more intellectual uh, side of this argument. I'm not going to miss it for so long. I'm not going to make a look at the nutrition. I'm going to suggest even in case of cancer, even for treatment. I don't know all the answers to that yet, but I'm going to suggest some basic things you may not have. That can be used just like it's used for the reverse of the Thank you very much. Up. 
Denmark, we should stop talking about Denmark's critical trial to the whole stand. Yeah. What's your opinion on yogurt? Because it's supposed to be probiotic, right? But uh, if yeah, it is... That's, that's, a, that's a new thing. I, I just kind of stuck up there because the first thing, it was so low in Berlin, I did my, did my master's thesis. I was thinking, I had chinchillas and rabbits. They digest the different levels of that. Just right. This is back in the 50s. And so I decided to take the basics of the chicken. Think for the all papers, but I just find the levels of that required to address, right? I want to see if you can take the, the contents, like the black and forward and the contents of the chinchilla. If you can the so I just got some uh, chinchilla pellets, ground blood, they have blood, they put them in the rabbit, so I jumped formation. So it was really interesting. Take the organism from one, put it over here, go into the survival, and they do that, and now they have a probiotic, but if you can get that kind of stuff, but interesting. I think that that's the that full body feels interesting. I have one question. It might be a little bit controversial. But why do you think we are seeing new cases, non-genetic cases, early type one diabetes? Yeah, I guess I've never heard that. Uh, yeah, that there's basically one down on that is you know that was true. Uh, from late 80s, early 90s especially, and pretty well worked thought out in my view, um, that the type 1 diabetes, at least for those children who are genetically susceptible, uh, when they're supposed to take them off of human breast milk, pulling cows milk especially, uh, they're the ones that tend to be the ones who will suffer the best effect. And it has to do with the levels of you, and I know uh, there's probably an example of what gets it down to the but actually, the total protein doesn't get digested as adequately in some cases, so you have to worry about polypeptides. In terms of that, it's been identified as a total polypeptide like 17 amino acids per lot. But somehow, when that forms, the fact is in the bloodstream, they're yelling in some children who don't feel an outcome. When that does get it's how we got an antibody response. And it's an antibody response, the body forms, and then the body gets that foreign protein, that little 17. It turns out that antibody, very specific, then sees the same thing on the surface of the uh, pancreatic auto cells that produce insulin. So it goes there and you've got that antibody attack on tissue. Like or not. It just eliminates the possibility so that it goes that for these infants, or a cow's milk, too early, they're going to suffer that kind of consequence and never be able to produce insulin for the rest of their lives. Type 1. There's some genetics important. Consideration of genetics here is one of the things we don't know for sure all the time. Those children are going to be susceptible to And it may happen to be on the way to do So I know there are a lot of other, other questions. I know people have a lot of questions. We're going to have an open forum in the conference room, which is a little bit easier to hear. Um, how many people think they're going to come to? Okay, we should be, we can fit about 20 people in there. 15, 20 people. Okay, so that would be good. Um, I really want to thank Dr. Campbell. Um, it's been wonderful. One thing he didn't touch on, and which I failed to mention, is the China study, which is an epidemiologic study. He focused a lot on his uh, basic science research. And the China study has been called by the New York Times the Grand Prix of epidemiologic research. Um, so if nobody, if people have not read the book or seen the movie or, you know, the book is better, right? Um, <laughs> If you, if you read that, that's also a very interesting scientific look at uh, disease and nutrition. So um, that's a whole other area of his specialty, wouldn't you say? It's right. a whole other area. Okay, so if we want to move um, towards the conference room, and we'll meet there in about five minutes, okay?